Hi, Sabrina. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Can you tell me a little bit about how you first started doing spoken word? Yes. Um, I mean, I was always doing poetry in a notebook secretly, and it wasn't until I was about 23, and I found out I had a tumor in my throat the wow. size of a squash ball. And how old are you now? 30. Okay. Uh, freshly 30. Uh, me too. Oh, congratulations. Good, good year, hey? You made it. Do you, feel, do you feel good about 30? Yes, I love it. I'm enjoying it so far, too. Yeah. I was a little um, scary. The, the actual minute of 11.59 to 12, I found it a little scary. It was my champagne birthday. I turned 30 on the 30th, so I've been looking forward to it for quite a while. Anyway, go on, 23. Anyways, so when I was 23, though, had a tumor in my throat, and my best friend said to me, oh, I bet you did that to yourself from swallowing all the things you always want to say. Um, what, what, what are you what, always what? writing in that notebook? Maybe you should share it with everyone. Can, can I be honest? Mm -hmm. Not typically the thing you say to someone who's suffering from a tumor in their throat. But perhaps the most um, frank thing you can say to someone when you know them very well. And the thing that was uh, bizarre about the tumor was that it wasn't cancer, which we found out pretty early on in the stages of figuring it out, but it was very aggressive anyways. So that kind of brought the urgency to me, like, hey, maybe I did do this to myself because there's no medical explanation. So I saw he actually, my best friend Cameron, signed me up for a spoken word workshop at OCAD. And did you have the tumor in your throat at the time? I did. Was it hard to speak? Um, no, it was just hard to swallow okay. a little bit here and there. And um, yeah, I went to that workshop and the lovely Andrea Thompson was facilitating it and she was the most welcoming person in the world. And I really felt comfortable sharing my work and that's what started everything. I want to play another clip. This is uh, something that came as a result of that push. This is another clip of Sabrina Benheim's piece explaining my depression to my mother. This is from the National Poetry Slam Championships in 2014. Mom says happy is a decision, but my happy is as hollow as a pinpricked egg. My happy is a high fever that will break. Mom says I am so good at making something out of nothing and then flat out asks me if I am afraid of dying. No, I am afraid of living. Mom, I am lonely. I think I learned the, how when dad left, how to turn the anger into lonely, the lonely into busy. So when I tell you I've been super busy lately, I mean, I've been falling asleep watching Sports Center on the couch to avoid confronting the empty side of my bed. But my depression always drags me back to my bed until my bones are the forgotten fossils of a skeleton sunken city. That was one of your first big performances. That's my guest, Sabrina Benheim, at the National Poetry Slam Championships in, in 2014. So that was your first year going to the National Poetry Slam. Mm -hmm. You're sharing so, not just something so personal, but something that most people don't share right. with thousands of strangers mm -hmm. who are, can I say this, sort of awkwardly yipping and whooping? <laughs> yes. <laughs> They don't really know when to do it, you know, like, and they don't know whether they should. Yeah. So you'll finish a line and you'll just hear this. Slam is interesting because the audience really gets into it. And in that particular bout, um, it was the semifinal bout. So you, you've got a room filled with poets that didn't make the semifinals that are like rare and for some poetry to finally cheer on somebody else because the pressure of kind of doing it yourself is gone. So and you have four teams competing that are trying to win that bout. Um, so it's really interesting because you're nervous, but you want to impress all these people a lot because after the, the competition's over, they're like the people you're hanging out with for the rest of the week. So it was weird. And there was legends in that room. Like Andrea Gibson was in the audience. Oh, wow. Buddy Wakefield was in the audience. So yeah, I was like, if, if that wasn't enough, if doing the poem and the context of the poem wasn't enough, I was in a room of people I adore. If you're naming slam poets, I know they have to be big. If yeah, I, if, if right? I've heard of them, exactly. they, they have to be pretty exactly. big. Exactly. Uh, but if you don't mind me saying this, and I mean this with the utmost respect, you did look a little nervous. Yeah, well, I was having a panic attack. Um, that was the first time I had ever said that poem on a stage before right. or out loud. I had only said it to my team that afternoon in the hotel, which garnered a similar reaction yeah. to how it was. And we were like, okay, just, just get through it. That was... It had been 10 years since a Canadian team had made the semifinals at the Nationals. So it was already a big deal mm -hmm. that we were just at that stage, on that stage. And then to do that poem on that stage for the first time just kind of got me. Is it, is it any easier now? I mean, do you, yes. still, do you still get panic attacks when you perform? No, I don't, luckily. Um, but it is much easier now. I do that poem pretty much in any school I ever walk in. 
um, any stage I ever step on. I think that poem is the most important thing I can share right now. Do you, do you still feel, how do I say this sensitively, do you still feel every word as part of your own experience or is it so kind of a narrative to you now that you're just able to say it? Um, I feel it. Some days I feel it more than others, definitely. Yeah. But part of what I like about it now is it's a bit of an anthem. So when I do walk in, usually people want to hear that piece and they know it. So it makes it feel like a shared experience and not so much this thing I'm harboring um, on stage anymore, which makes it easier to do because, I mean, the shock of it being I'm the only person in the world that feels this way is long gone. If you... Um I know, I know you've talked about this a million times, but for people on, who are listening to the show on, on the radio or on the podcast who haven't heard the story before, can you tell me a little bit of the backstory of that poem? Yeah. Um, I, had, I had been struggling for a long time, I would say at least since high school. And in my family, there's just really no language for mental illness or mental health, or there wasn't at the time. There is now. Yeah. And it just was difficult like it was difficult I've always had a very supportive family which has been a blessing but sometimes when you're you're kind of blindly supporting someone you're not really taking the time to understand what they're going through you're just like it's okay you can do it just you're stronger than this don't be lazy go go to school do your best and you kind of miss the communication of like why is this so hard for you what is what are you struggling with that you're finding going to school is such a difficult task and so once this poem came out, which my mom actually heard it for the first time while it was on YouTube. Um, How'd she take it? She took it, I think she was relieved. I think she understood. I think she was relieved that that got out of my body, like that peace and that understanding. Because so much of it too, as much as the poem is about explaining it to my mother, like you have to understand it yourself to understand you have no control over this thing first and yeah. I think that's part of the the poem is like a mutual understanding of like I don't mom you don't get it I don't get it either let's yeah. work from there I mean the, the one thing I think is missing from the, the sort of reaction to your poem in the comments that I saw and I, and I think this is where you're coming from is that it's not a judgment no against your mother for not getting it I remember when I remember when I first had uh, a panic attack that was bad enough I had to go to the hospital and I was in, I was at my parents house in Newfoundland, where I'm from, and I had to get my mom to take me, you know, and I didn't know what it was. And I think there was a moment afterwards where she went like, wow, like this is, this is, I've never seen this before. This is, this is a real thing. And I didn't feel any judgment towards her for not getting it before that because I didn't know what it, know right. what it was either. Exactly. It's not about judging people for not getting it. No, it's about, it's about both people stepping into the conversation at ground zero saying we both don't understand what's happening here yeah. because I think ultimately especially with my mom, she would be like, okay, but what can I do to help you? How can I help you? How can I help you? And the hard part is if you don't know how, what kind of help you need. Or how to help yourself. Or how to help yourself. You yeah. can't tell another person. And then, you know, you, you start feeling bad and you feel guilty that you can't help tell this person and the other person is feels resented that they want to help you, but they can't. And just creates a lot of confusion. Uh, I, I've had friends of mine who suffer from, from chronic depression. Just depression will say, like, people tell them, why don't you call a friend? Or yeah. They mean it. They mean it in the best possible way. Yes, absolutely. And it makes sense when you, like, I can't fault my mom for saying go to a real party instead of, you know, the pity party that is yourself. Like, in her logic, I can't fault her for that because she would have the ability to just get up and go out. It's that, that barrier doesn't hit her, so she wouldn't even realize what that feels like to overcome it. You know, like, I had to call my friends... One time, just being like, I can't come to the party tonight because I'm standing in my doorway and I can't leave. Yeah. And I don't expect them to understand how that feels. I just need them to understand that that's very real for me. That it's happening. Exactly. It's happening. And so I'm going to let you have a drink of water. Cool. Uh, okay. If you're just tuning in, I'm Tom Power. You're listening to Q. Sabrina Benheim is my guest, spoken word poet and author of Depression and Other Magic Tricks. Can you read us something from your new book? I can, yeah. What are you thinking? Um, I'm thinking that... I'd maybe like to do this one for my friends. I don't get to talk about platonic love too often. So can you set it up a little bit before you read it? Yeah, this is a piece that is a bit more of a prose narrative. And I think it's really important, you know, when we are talking about support structures, that we do all have friends and sometimes they're actively our chosen family. And they're very important to us. And I, I don't think we talk about that, that love a lot. So this is a piece I wrote for them. It's called On Platonic Love Being a Real Thing. While drinking pear cider on E's rooftop for Kay's birthday, S asks, do you remember your first kiss? 
I laugh, yes, of course. It was during a game of spin the bottle. Look, he's sitting across from us at this table right now. A senses our attention, looks at me mid-bite of his hamburger, pulls it out of his mouth and opens up, showing the product of his chewing. All three of us laugh. S says I totally get it. I think about that game of spin the bottle. How A was the only boy to come to my grade 7 birthday party. How we still played spin the bottle and all kissed whoever it landed on. I think about how E was my prom date and the first girl I kissed with tongue, and how that kiss was actually just a secret pack to make me promise not to tell H E was smoking. And that same night, we slept over at H's house. K and I shared a bed, and she took off her shirt and bra before she got in, so I did too, and it was no thing. That time, S and I spent a night laughing naked. I think about each relationship sitting at the table, how we trust each other with our whole bodies, how that's love. Now isn't that love? It's pretty beautiful. Thanks. It's funny, too. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I started laughing at it and I didn't know whether that was going to be okay. Yeah. All right. It is okay. Thank absolutely. you. Sabrina Benheim, the, the, the poem's name is uh, On Platonic Love Being a Real Thing from her new book, Depression and Other Magic Tricks. A lot of the success that you found has been online. Yes. So why a book? Um, I always dreamed of a book. I was always hoping. Um, I, I saw s Slam and Spoken Word as kind of like my coyote ugly what? Attempt where I'd have to, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, The erstwhile piece of that cinema. Is, <laughs> that is Coyote, Coyote Ugly. Ugly, yeah. But she... Um, I have the criterion at home. Right. Yeah, that's great. Okay, <laughs> so I do not. she wanted to... She wanted to become a songwriter, so she found that she had to sing her own songs in order for people to hear them. And that's kind of how I felt about my work. I had to say it out loud in order for people to want to read it. Which is interesting now that I find myself saying it out loud much more often but it's really nice to have a book so this was this is this was kind of around. the goal yeah this was the goal absolutely I, I, but i can only imagine uh, putting these poems about dealing with depression and anxiety into a book allows you to paint a more nuanced picture right right yes because in the slam poetry i get to see the the lows of depression right this is this is more about the the everyday. The day-to-day, -day. yeah, the yeah. nuance of it. And the days you feel normal, the days you feel... And yeah, sometimes a normal day is like a a, a B day, you know? It's not a, an A plus or an A. A normal is just a B where, yeah. you know, you're just a little bit... As soon as I said the word normal, I regretted it. No, it's it's good. There's a piece in here um, called... I don't, I don't remember what it's titled right now, but it's about going through a day, like waking up and just feeling like, okay, everything in my apartment is talking to me and... I'm just like, oh, I just have to put up my hair and take it down 35 times until I feel comfortable. Yeah. It's like really about that nuance of like, that's a rough yeah. day, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. But on days, but on days, you only had to do it 12 times. Oh, so it's yeah, okay. It's yeah, okay better. Day. Self care yeah. can feel. Yeah, it, the end is like it can make you feel a little bit like the mascot. You yeah, know? I've only of thought about dying. I've only thought yeah. I was dying twice today. Yeah, exactly. Maybe <laughs> I woke up and thought, well, all right. <laughs> yeah, maybe <laughs> Here this, this, I is, this is you know, as days go, this is not too bad. Yeah. Um, what do you get from, okay, I want to ask this in two ways. So mm -hmm. one, what do you get from seeing the comments online like the ones I described? People telling you about their own experiences with mental illness and depression. Listen, the first thing I did when I came in, mm -hmm. which I also kind of regret, <laughs> the first thing I did when I came in was told you about my, my experience. Yeah. What, what do you get from that? In, I think it's fantastic. Way? I think that's the conversation we all want to be having mm -hmm. or we want to feel comfortable having. And I think that it's incredible you know, really and truly, uh, the people that message me online, like, I, I always joke that I have, like, an internet full of friends. Like, I don't call them my internet strangers. Like, they're my friends. Mm -hmm. um, they know me quite well, and it's really amazing. Actually, um, to jump into real time, I received a package this morning from a girl in Missouri that I pen pal with. No. Oh. Yes. And she sent me a quote that she, like, painted, um, hand-lettered for me. And it's, like, and her and I just chat. If we're having a rough day, I just check in with her. She'll check in with me. And, like, how can you have that without having an internet, first of all? And how can you have that without having shared something so personal that somebody feels, hey, I don't want to talk to any of my friends about how I'm feeling today. They're sick of hearing about it. Let me talk to you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's really nice to be able to just open yeah. an inbox and talk to someone that you check up on. But, it's, but I guess it's, it's unreal. Not, it's not the... It's the other side of things I'm also curious about because I also know that like sometimes, unless I'm wrong, when you read, when someone sends you a comment like, yeah, I mean, I, I felt this way, I thought about this, it might actually trigger you in a yes. certain way. Yes, yes. I have had to take breaks from checking my inboxes. That is certainly true. I've had some, um, yeah, sometimes I, 
I find it hard to say to someone, you know, like, why would you think I have the answer? Um, because I, I clearly don't. Right. I feel like I've, I'm talking about it, and that's the most I can do to, like, have a, a quote-unquote answer is to just give you my experience. But I don't know how to fix yeah. your yeah, I mean, problem. Because you're, you're talking about like the that. ellipsis, right? Right. You're talking about the continuation Yes. That's not ending. That's and not they're, ending. And they're looking for a solution. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's just something I navigate. It's not something that I feel like I've overcome. So sometimes it's hard. Some messages are really hard to read because I can't help. And it's hard. Um, sometimes people reach out at really harrowing times. That can be hard, too. Stomach yeah. a little bit. Because if that's, you're not trained in that. You right. Know? Right. And sometimes, you know, you respond and you don't get a message back, and that can be scarier. Yeah. So... Um, how about parents? Do you hear from parents? I hear from a lot of parents, and those are probably, you know, my favorite messages. When a mom is like, my daughter shared her poem with me, and now I, we we understand each other, or like, I go to school now um, every day and talk to my counselor because my mom supports me. It's like, oh, my god. Yeah, because you're not going to get many, like, yeah. saw your poem, still don't believe it. <laughs> Some parents will actually message me and be like, what, what did your mom do? How did she help you? Like, how did she Aww. react? And I find that even endearing because they're like, okay, I really still don't understand, but what's the next step? Do you show that to your mom? Yes, I do. My mom loves it. I, my mom loves to comment on it. She's She holds herself back from YouTube and stuff, but she loves to comment on my Instagram things when other people... <laughs> She'll be like, did you see the comments you got today? <laughs> They're so beautiful. I'm like, yes, I always saw them. <laughs> she seems very proud of you. She is. I'm very lucky. Even my dad is pretty proud. Um, I'm going to – I've been kind of wrestling this entire conversation about whether I was going to ask you this question at the mm -hmm. end, but I think I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to do it. Okay. okay. So um, if people are listening to this right now who haven't seen the poem mm – -hmm. who, but who might be struggling with anxiety or depression themselves, do you have anything you want to say to them? Um, yeah, talk to somebody, anybody. It doesn't have to be the doctor. It can be your friend or I think it's just important to say, tell one other person how you're feeling truly mm -hmm. and just go from there because it, it's so important to talk about it. You know, like you said, it's the first thing. If you know that it's a safe place to talk to someone, you'll bring it up. It's the first thing you said to me just so we could relate. And mm -hmm. I feel like if you're struggling, somebody in your life that you don't know relates will relate to you. I felt like I didn't want to talk about it for the longest time because I thought if I talked about it, it made me lose my edge. Like I was a creative <laughs> person that that somehow would be fettered by talking to someone about it. I would, yeah, yeah, totally just gone the other way of that and embraced it. People well, yeah. are like, are you the depression girl? And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> you can call me Sabrina, though. <laughs> or depression girl is fine. Yeah, whichever, whichever. It's been so great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me.